and welcome to our Sunday morning service at Covenant Life Church. My name is Danuta Case, and I'm here on behalf of Pastor Tim, who desperately wanted to be here today. More, he was determined to be here. However, on Friday, his respiratory infection took a turn for worse. And right now, he's struggling with shortness of breath and even speaking at a regular volume. Thank you so much for praying for him and for supporting him. You have been amazing. Many of you sent cards, encouraging notes, the video that was made for his birthday from his Covenant Life Church family was very encouraging and uplifting. Thank you for doing that. And please continue to pray for him. Also, please pray for my Kedar and his family. Mike, in addition to battling the cancer, contracted pneumonia and is currently in the hospital on heavy antibiotics. So please pray for him and pray for his family. Also, don't forget about our virtual prayer meetings on Wednesday night. We sent the Zoom link to all of our people on our mailing list, but if you'd like to join us, please go to our website, covlifechurch.net, and contact us. We will be very happy to send you the Zoom link as well. At this time, please join us in worshiping the Lord, your creator and your God. Do not do it in a passive way, please, but engage. Let us worship him together. Worship team, please lead us.
to be praised. You're worthy to be praised, Jesus. You're worthy to be praised. If you can, with your hands, just help us with your hands. The Lord is worthy to be praised. of you, Lord. Thank you. It's all because the blood of Jesus Christ that covers me and raised this dead man's life. And it's all because we're singing again. And it's all Last time. 
of you is that we is because we're alive thank you for your sacrifice on the cross we trust you we trust you Lord Jesus before we move to the next song one of the things that the Lord has been speaking to me this week is just thankfulness and how thankful we should be for who he is and for the things he has done so what I want to invite you to do it with very that you're at home if you have a piece of paper and you can have a, a pen just write the things that you are grateful for things like your family your friends your health your house the things that you're thankful for and the reason I'm asking you to write these things is so that we can put it somewhere to remember how good he is Or if you don't have a piece of paper, why don't you speak out and thank the Lord for the things that He has done. But think about it. What are the things that you are thankful for? So I will give you a few seconds. So you can just either write them down or speak out the things that you are thankful for. He is worthy. He's worthy, so I'll give you a few seconds. know this song I invite you to sing with us if you don't know just meditate in the lyrics
walls of white They are blazing sun Shall pierce the night And I will rise Among the saints My gaze transfixed At Jesus' face Sing it that one more time That is His promise to us He shall return Tell him how good he is, how awesome he is. Oh, we, praise we praise you, God. You are awesome. You are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Oh, we, stand for you now. we give you praise. We give you praise. Let's sing this together. And oh, here, King Jesus.
Jesus. You are the Savior of the world. And we praise you. Every knee, every tongue confess that he is Lord. You are holy. You are worthy. We thank you. And we praise you once more. In your precious name. joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. You might be struggling with health or finances or relationships. At times, we might be mis mistreated or even disrespected or whatever it is that you are facing. We can't always control the circumstances. We don't often have any influence over what other people do. But we do have a choice. And we do have a way to determine how we are going to respond. So what do we usually do? How do we respond to various circumstances and various people? How should we respond? See, when Tim got sick, and by the way, for those of you who don't know, he is my husband. Even when I took him to the hospital, I immediately contacted many people, asked them to pray. And I was full of faith. And I was very encouraged by seeing the response. So many people prayed and joined us in prayer. But as two weeks went by and I saw him getting frustrated and getting worse. And at one point, you know, he was so eager and so uh, very much desired to come and minister to you. He had a word on his heart and he wanted to deliver it to you. And as I was talking to him and as I was watching him, my heart was broken. And I went to my office so that I could be alone. I fell on my face and I just cried out and said, God, why? There was no doubt in my mind that he loves us, that he cares that he heals, that he strengthens. But I absolutely did not understand what was happening. And so in the midst of it all, I was crying and said, God, what are you doing? Why aren't you lifting him up? Why aren't you strengthening him? And as I was praying and crying before the Lord, he prompted me with two questions. One of them was, will you trust me? And the other one was, what choice are you going to make? And right then, I was hit with the realization of the fact that we all have a choice. See, God has given you everything that you need. He is giving you and offering you salvation. He offers you help. He offers you strength. But we have a part to play. Every single day of our lives, we have to make many choices. So as you are facing difficulties, and as you are facing various circumstances that you don't have any control over it, what is going to be your response? And that is the choice that you have. If you are struggling just like I was, not understanding the circumstances, I realized I had a choice. I could become discouraged, stop thanking him, stop worshiping, and just have casual prayer. Or I could say, Lord, I don't understand, but I will choose to praise you. I will choose to thank you. I will choose to worship you and to serve you. 
And so just like Joshua, when he addressed the nation of Israel, he said, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. That's Joshua 24, 15. Choose for yourself this day. And so I would like to challenge all of us, including myself, what is going to be your choice and your response to the people around you and to the circumstances that you face? See, when you get discouraged, perhaps when you get hurt, you have a choice. When you get mistreated, you have a choice to feel sorry for yourself, to be sad, to be discouraged, and to continue in that, waiting for that person to apologize. Or you can forgive and start praying for that person. When you feel lonely and you feel like nobody is reaching out to you, you have a choice. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it might be very difficult. But you have a choice to start feeling sorry for yourself, to sit down, to feel discouraged, to become resentful because nobody cares, because nobody is reaching out to me. Or you can say, Lord, who do you want me to reach out to? Lord, who do you want me to minister to? You have a choice. You have a part to play. We all do. So today, I would like to repeat Joshua's words and say, choose for yourself this day how you respond to people around you. Choose for yourself this day how you are going to respond to your circumstances. We all are facing circumstances that we don't like. I don't like speaking to a camera. I much rather speak to all of you sitting here in the sanctuary. But we have a choice to do it anyway or not to do it. So today, I would like to challenge you and myself. Choose you this day. How you respond. Make the right choice every day. As you face new circumstances, new situations, Make a choice that is pleasing to God. He is here to help you, to strengthen you, and he promised to do so. But it is up to you to make that determination, to make that choice. What decision are you going to make? So in closing, I would like to say, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I hope that all of you are going to make that choice and say, I make the choice to serve him, to be thankful, to do what he has called me to do. May the Lord help us in doing so. At this point, I would like to invite our speaker, Reverend Chris Lightline, a minister and a very good friend of ours. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Danuta. Uh-oh, we're not, no. How am I going to wash my hands now? Sanitize well, it. Oh, okay, we'll sanitize. Well, praise God. I am so excited to be here. Cynthia and I are excited to be here. Good morning, Covenant Life Church. We love you. We appreciate you. As I was sitting here as the service was starting, I was thinking, boy, I'm really used to sitting in my lounger on Sunday morning, as many of you are now. So after this, I will talk with Pastor Tim, and I'll see what we can do about taking all these brown chairs out, and we'll get some nice loungers and couches in so that you can all continue to live in the uh, level to which you've grown accustomed. So anyways, um, I just I, I, I so appreciate this church. It is hard to talk to a camera uh, rather than having you all here, but... Uh, please know that the Lord is with us when we are gathered together in our hearts. Some of what I have to say this morning may sound a bit negative because the world that we are dealing with right now is so upside down. Everything we're used to uh, is gone out the window. Normal is not normal anymore. 
and we don't know whether it will continue or come back to what it was. And uh, Danuta, thank you so much um, because I really can probably drop about half of what I was going to preach because you just shared it up from your own heart. But um, I know that many of you are asking yourselves uh, these questions during these uncertain times. Where is this all going to end up? What can I do to make it better? And am I going to lose some of the things that I love? We're already facing some of these issues. And this is what happens anytime we live in uncertain times. Pastor Tim, if you're hearing this right now, please know we are praying for you and praying for your healing and the Spirit of God to fall upon you and restore your body. And uh, Danuta, I thank you for your faithfulness to your husband and to this church. So as we deal with all these uncertain times, uh, I started thinking and I thought, you know, I really prefer my life to be very predictable, to have things moving on an uphill pattern on a real regular basis. Okay, I can take a little down once in a while, but not this really uh, huge amount of turmoil that we're facing right now. And the fact of the matter is, though, when life is not predictable, this is when the Lord can get our attention. As you know, God is primarily interested in changing our character. And in order to change our character, just like with a child, we have to get the attention of the child. God wants your attention right now. Is he getting your attention? I think he is. I think he is. God has called us to look at life completely in light of our relationship with him. So it's critical that we understand why is it that we get so bent out of shape when things do not go the way we expect them to go. Now, I don't think I'm the only one who does this. I think you all probably do this a little bit. We get bent out of shape, we get, we, we, we get frustrated, and we're trying to understand what we can do and how we can change it. And that, though, is when we get in that position, that is when God is able to get our attention and to tell us what we should do to get our heads in the right place so that we can walk in the fullness of his promises. Let's look at John 16, 32 through 33. Uh, Jesus had just plainly explained to his disciples that he was returning to the Father, but he says, don't worry, I'm coming back. And they're like, oh, yes, he's coming back. Oh, this is going to be great because we know what he's going to do is he's going to help us conquer the Romans, and he's going to make us the rulers of the earth, and we know things will be in good shape then. I think they really were not quite getting what his intent was. And so he gave these words to help them understand what it was that he really intended on doing. John 16, 32 through 33 says, Indeed, the hour is coming, yes, has now come, that you will be scattered, each to his own, and will leave me alone. And yet... I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. These verses are full of proclamations from our Lord Jesus. A proclamation is just, it's like a public announcement of some great truth. And so this is what the Lord is doing for us here. And let's break this down a little bit. The first thing he said that really struck out, uh, was pointed out to me, was that he said, these things I have spoken to you that in me, in the Lord, you may have peace. The key is that it is in Jesus that we are going to find our peace. 
He wants to be sure, as he wanted back then, he wants us to be sure now that we are looking to the right place for our peace. What is it that satisfies us? How is it that we feel and know we can be settled? Secondly, he gives this wonderful proclamation of truth. In the world, you will have tribulation. There are those who teach that if you're a Christian, you're not going to have tribulation. I don't believe it. It's right here. In the world, you will have tribulation. The world is a place where troubles come, where things happen, and it's a place where God gets our attention because he wants to change us and make our character more and more and more like him. So here's this sad thing that he's saying in the world, uh, he's promising us this tribulation, but what is really happening here? What is he saying? He is comparing something. He's telling us in him we have peace, but in the world we have tribulation. He is comparing two kingdoms. The kingdom of God is not like the kingdom of man, the kingdom of the earth. And this is very important. And I want you to ask yourself this question. What is your citizenship? I'm not asking what country are you from. I'm asking what is your true citizenship? My citizenship, though I am an American, I was born in the United States, but my citizenship first and foremost is in the kingdom of God. And I am a child of the Lord Jesus, of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm a child of the Father. Uh, the Lord Jesus is my brother. And I am of that kingdom and that citizenship. The third thing to look at is that the Lord said, be of good cheer. I have, opened, have overcome the world. Be of good cheer. He is saying, it's okay. Be happy. He just said there's going to be tribulation, but he doesn't say, oh, come on, I'll sit down and cry with you. I know you feel bad. He's saying, be of good cheer. Let's allow the Lord to teach us and show us how we can do that. Every victory has been won in him. He overcame the world, and every victory that he has won, he has given to us, that we can then share it with others. But first and foremost, that we would know that we have the victory in him. Our hearts and our minds are set in him, and we walk in that victory. We can be overcomers as well. So if you've given your life to Christ, and these words ring, th ring true in your heart, the word of God rings true in your heart, that is the witness of the Holy Spirit within you, leading you into all truth. You have to ask yourself, then, why do I struggle and fuss when I'm dealing with times of uncertainty? The Lord has said, be of good cheer. Why am I not of good cheer? Why am I struggling with this? There are many ways to approach dealing with these uh, frustrations, but uh, what I wanted to look at here is three primary areas. I skipped my place there. Bear with me. Three primary things that we become frustrated with when things are not going our way, and the world is turned upside down. First, we do not know what the outcome is going to be. Do you understand? That's frustrating. I want to know where things are going. I want to understand the outcome. Second, we are unable to control the situation. In the world, things are just happening. They're moving along, and we cannot control everything that goes on. And thirdly, let me get all three of them up. Thirdly, there, are, there is fear in us sometimes that we are going to lose something that is critical to our happiness. Lose something critical to our happiness. So, okay, so here's these three things, and I started thinking about them, and I thought, you know, 
you can find seminars that's going to deal with any one of these things. You can go on YouTube today. You can sign up for seminars. You can go places, and you can get taught how to deal with the frustrations in life. But you know what? If we want the peace of God, and uh, I wanted to put in a, a, a word, Pastor Tim's word on the peace of God uh, from a couple weeks back was absolutely excellent. We need to view each of these three things through the eyes of God's truth. So let's look at the first one. It is frustrating when we don't know what the outcome of our current situation is going to be. When we give in to this frustration, it is a reflection of something that's going on inside our hearts that we need to be very careful of. The fact is, it's a reflection that we have not released our future into the hands of God. We must release our future into the hands of God. We are doubting that he will take care of us. We must realize that the way that God directs us into our future is very different from what we would like to see. Let me look at uh, Psalm 119. There we are. Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. It does not say that the Lord is going to give us a light to our destination. I would like to know that my destination is up there. I, I was thinking about this, and I thought of the Emerald City in The Wizard of Oz, for those of you who remember that. There from way off, they saw the Emerald City, and they're like, yeah, now I can do it. Now I'm going to run to that. It gives me energy. But you know what the Lord said? I'm going to be a light to your feet and a light to your path. There is a working that he is doing within us that we will learn to trust him one step at a time. This is so critical in growing up in the Lord, growing up and maturing is that we trust him one step at a time. He is interested that we know the path, not the outcome. The outcome is in his hands. He is operating in our lives with a far bigger picture of where he wants to take us than what we may be ready to understand at a given point in time. I want you to consider the life of Esther in the scriptures. The beautiful story of Esther who became the, uh, the queen. She then uh, was able, in the long run, was able to save her entire nation. I want to tell you something. Esther did not start that journey uh, thinking, oh, won't this be great? That king's going to love me so much that be just because he loves me, he's going to save the whole nation. No, she went step by step. She risked her life. She knew she was facing death. And yet the Lord put his anointing on the situation and he saved the nation through her. And so there's that famous word in there that says, you have been formed uh, her uncle says to her, you have been formed for such a time as this. And I want you to understand what God is doing in all of us at this time. He is forming in you something very, very special for such a time as this. These are uncertain times for everybody. We don't know what the future holds. But God is saying it is his heart's desire to form in us a release of the outcome to his hands so that he can do his marvelous work in our lives. And we must do this by staying in him. In this next verse, Acts 1-7, Paul said to us that... Uh, or well, this was Jesus speaking, and he said to them in one of his appearances, it is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. Do you understand this? We want to know, and we feel we have a right to know the outcome, don't we? We have a right to know the outcome, but God is saying, no, you need to release this to me. 
So the important point here is that it is not for you to know. Like any good parent, God is trying to tr teach us, his children, to trust him. If a parent explains every little detail of every step that a child has to do in order for them to do it, I think you're going to have trouble with that child down the road. They are not going to know that when mommy or daddy yells, watch out, that they have to move like that and they got to stop. Maybe it's in a parking lot where a car, they're not paying attention. They're running somewhere perhaps dangerous. This is what the Lord wants to work in our hearts. Trust him for the outcome. Be in him. One more verse because I want you to look at this with a light heart. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. The outcome that is in God's hands is good. The outcome that is in God's hands can be trusted. I wanted to share very quickly, as I walked through, uh, when I accepted the Lord, I was 19 years old. I know I've shared some of this with you before. I was a hippie. I rode a motorcycle, had my leather jacket. I was a lot younger. But the thing that, one of the things that happened to me in the very, very early months of getting saved is I said, Lord, I want to get my life together. I want to put things right. I want to uh, make them right. And I wanted to serve God with my whole heart. So I thought, I'm going to get out of debt. I'm going to sell my motorcycle. I owe the bank money on it. So I did that. And uh, a guy call, called me up. This is uh, before we did things online. He, he saw this ad I had run. He called me up. He came over. He says, OK, let me take a look at this. He parked a nice Mustang in my driveway. And we talked for about 15 minutes. Nice guy. He says, well, let me take it for a spin. I said, sure, take it for a spin. Here's the mat, the helmet with the matching paint job to match the tank. He took off down the road and probably started laughing as soon as he got out of my sight. 15 minutes later, I'm thinking, as I sat on my porch step, he should have been back by now. So finally, I called the police. I thought, well, maybe he had an accident or something. And the police said, oh, what kind of car is in your driveway? And I said, well, it's this nice red Mustang. He says, oh, yeah, that vehicle was reported stolen uh, just uh, an hour ago. So as it works out, I still owed the bank the money. Uh, there was no insurance on it. I had dropped my insurance because of the season. And I was devastated. And I thought, wow, Lord, this is following you? I don't get this at all. And my new Christian friends came over. I had a couple of new friends then. And the one kept saying to me, oh, Chris, Romans 8.28, God works all things together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And I said, oh, well, that's a great thought. But for me... It didn't really do a lot because I owed the bank, I believe, $800 at the time, and I didn't know quite what I was going to do. And so I said, well, whatever. I just have to move on. I'm still going to trust God, but we'll see what happens. Five years later, I met this lovely lady down here, and we fell in love. We were just crazy in love. We knew, hey, man, we got to get married. And I said, I said to the Lord, Lord, if I just had 1000 bucks." We could buy a house. And I just thought, well, that's it. So I don't know. I, I haven't gone fishing. I haven't seen if there's any fish with money in their mouths yet, but I'm not sure if that's going to work now. So I just kind of sat and waited to see, well, what's God going to do? Well, a couple days later, I got a telephone call. Toronto Canada Police called and said, is this Chris Lideline? And my immediate response was, shut up. Who is this? Well, that's me. I thought it was one of my old friends pranking me. It was not. It was the Toronto Police Department who did not like being told to shut up. And he said, all right, uh, listen, do you own a 69 Triumph? Because we found it in a parking lot here. 
and we went through all the trouble of doing what they called an acid test, pulled up the old numbers, which had been ground off, and we realized this is your stolen motorcycle. I picked it up. It was in as good a shape as when it had been stolen five years ago. And God, the outcome that God had was that that was the down payment for our first house. Now, did I understand that five years before? Not at all. But I'm telling you, that was a lesson in trusting God for where he is taking you and not looking at the circumstances. Okay, let's go to the next issue, which is frustration when I cannot control the situation. Let me start out by saying this on this section. God has formed us in his image and likeness. His character has been formed. It doesn't mean that we look like God. Jesus chose to look like us. But he formed us like him. We have an image and a likeness. And we like to do things on our own, as God likes to do things on his own. And I started looking at this from a very young age. We see things happening. What's a child start to say when you go to tie his shoes and he's figured out, he says, I can do it myself. And we congratulate them for that. Oh, man. When my kids got potty trained, that was an amazing time. That was wonderful. When they started putting their own clothes on, when they started putting things away, when they started doing it by themselves. What is that? That's control. That's control. So we do that when we're young. In business, we are super focused on control. Goals, strategies, objectives. My first job, oh, Lord help me, I was four years in hospitals uh, doing strategic planning, which was ridiculous because I was right out of college. I had no clue what went on in hospitals. But the job was to establish things so that we could accomplish a task. And I understand this. We need this in a business. Uh, the Marines are trained with the saying, improvise, adapt, and overcome. Hoorah. Okay? So there's this uh, it's not just that we have to control, but if we see things that happen in life that aren't the way we want them to be, and we need to adjust and take control, okay, so that we can overcome. But who is the one who has overcome now? I think moms learn in much more subtler ways, moms and wives, how to maintain control, but I'm not going to go into that one much as far as the wives, because I want to walk out of here and have a peaceful lunch. So pray for me. So the Lord wants us to have a right attitude on control. Let's look at Matthew 16, 21 through 23. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes. And he was to be killed and be raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But Jesus turned and says to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but of the things of men. I love Peter. He's so out there. He says what he thinks. He's trying to do the right thing. He's telling God, you are not going to do this. Anybody here said that to God before? This is not right. This is not fair. This is not good. Let me get you straightened out, God. We'll clear this up, and then we can move ahead. Just follow these instructions. But this is not the way the Lord is doing things in our lives. When we are in Christ, we can then understand when we are being carnally minded and thinking of the things of uh, being mindful of the things of the world, of the world, the things of men, 
or when we are being spiritual and being mindful of the things of God. We need a, a, a governor. Anybody who's worked with engines, little engines, you have this something in there called a governor. It kind of grabs the amount of wind that's being created by the turning of the engine, and it just it holds things down. We need this in our lives. The governor in our lives is the Holy Spirit, which we must be in Christ to be listening to the Holy Spirit because he will say, wait a minute, wait a minute, you're going down the wrong path. I have what is right for you. I will teach you what needs to be uh, in your hands, and you need to release what needs to be in my hands. Acts 17, 28 says, this is Paul speaking, and I just love, this is one of my favorite verses. In him we live we move, we have our being. Life, movement, the essence of our existence, it all exists in Jesus. And so when it comes to control, that exists in Jesus. Now listen, God is not interested in making us a bunch of robots. God does not want us to, it's not that we let God put strings on us that make us move but God is saying, let me instruct you in the right way to move. His ways are far above our ways. His thinking far above our thinking. And he is willing to work with us as a good father. Some of you might be saying right now when I talk about this, in him we live and move and have our being, well, that's the kind of thing a preacher has to learn to do. Me, I'm just a regular workaday guy, or I'm just a mom, or I'm, uh, I'm a student, I'm a kid. We are all his children. We all have to learn how to walk in him and how to have our being in him. The word says to pray without ceasing. How can we do that if we are not praying to him and placing ourselves in him. Okay, so for the third thing we then have is that it is frustrating when I fear I will lose something I consider critical to my happiness. Now, I get this. When I feel I'm going to lose something that I think is part of what makes me happy, I get worried. And let me explain something. We are... Most of us listening are Americans. For those of you that aren't or maybe grew up in another culture, let me explain something about the American attitude towards happiness. We think it's so critical that we even wrote it into our Constitution that we have a right to the pursuit of happiness. The problem is we go about getting our happiness in the wrong ways. When we do not live in him, we confuse the things that will produce happiness. Let's look at two verses, Matthew 6, 25 and Romans 14, 7. Therefore, in Matthew, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than than clothing in Romans 14 17 again for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking but righteousness peace and joy in the Holy Spirit it's so easy to confuse the basis of what things should make us happy food drink shelter clothing uh, how about new shoes Okay, these are all wonderful things. I'm not disallowing that. But if our happiness is contingent on these worldly things, be ready for a world of hurt. Be ready for huge disappointment because you've missed the mark. When we give ourselves to the ways of the world, we're being very short-sighted regarding the good things that God is trying to give to us. The word says, be of good cheer. I have overcome 
the world. Not be of good cheer. I'm going to give you a nice house, a nice car, and a comfy couch to sit in. I hope you're comfortable right now. But what the Lord is saying is that we need to have our eyes set on him and what he has overcome and the long range of where he is taking us. And in that, we find joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. But also, we find good cheer. We find happiness in him. So let me conclude. I really believe each one of us needs fresh revelation to understand what it means to live in him. And that is a unique thing. I can't come here and say, well, here's what you need and come up with a blanket thing that everybody that works for everybody because God is working a very unique thing within each one of our hearts. He has made us as individuals. His thoughts about you are thoughts about you as an individual. And he will deal with you. He will lead you. He will direct you into a greater understanding of what he is doing in your life and of how to deal with things uh, that life throws at you and how to remain in him. And this is part of the change that occurs where he is saying, I want you to be a new person. From what you are, I'm going to make you more in my image. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. This is a standard in the relationship for a Christian that goes on every day. God wants to grab hold of something fresh in you because we're not complete yet. But he is forming something that is a beautiful, beautiful thing before him. So let God change you, give you a new mind, truly place you in him. So I want you to pray with me. And this might sound a little odd, but I really felt that for all of you, lay your hand on your heart or perhaps even on your head because we need a new heart and we need the mind of Christ. We need to be changed by God. He said he would change us and mold us into his image. So Lord, help me. Help each one of us to live in you. Make me a new creation. One that trusts in you completely. For the outcome. To release control and for my happiness, that it would be established in you. Lord, give to us, give to me the mind of Christ, even as you have promised in your word. Help me to lay down all my wrong ways of thinking and of doing things and of worrying. Help me lay them at the foot of the cross where you overcame the world. And as you looked to the Father, Lord, help me also to always look to you and look to the Father. I pray this in the name of Jesus. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Enjoy this beautiful weather we have so far today. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Chris. I believe it was a word inspired by God. Thank you very much. The good thing about online services is that you can re-listen to them if you didn't take good notes or if you don't remember. Let us apply it. May you have a wonderful week. May God bless you.